Good morning and welcome to Walnut United Methodist Church. Thank you for being part of our worshiping community today. A few announcements before we get going, um, and that is to tell you that today is the last day of February. Tomorrow starts March, and so we will have our trustees meeting um, at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So if you are a part of the trustees, please be there. Also, I wanted to um, restate and re-invite you uh, on March 21st, we will be celebrating, um, not celebrating, but marking the first year of COVID. Um, it was March 13th of last year that we uh, stopped in-person worship and uh, we are going to honor all of those that we have lost in the last year. So if you have people that you would like to honor, not only um, people who have uh, passed from COVID, but also who have passed this year, um, there is a lot of grieving um, to be done, a lot of honoring uh, people's lives. So please send me their names, uh, their information, photographs, if you have them and we'll um, put something together for March 21st. Also, I wanted to note uh, uh, something special about this Lenten season. We are um, in honor of and to stand in solidarity with uh, our Asian American brothers and sisters. We are celebrating uh, the gifts that they bring to our community and to the world. Um, standing against the violence that uh, has has infected their community um, and has done such great harm uh, to our uh, Asian American brothers and sisters. And so we are blessed uh, with the um, offerings of two uh, Korean United Methodist clergy who came together in the uh, New England Conference uh, the Reverend Johan Go and Reverend Juhi Ju Lee, and um, they worked with other uh, people in their community to put together um, some special music and some uh, anthems and some uh, hymns that are from the United Methodist tradition. And so all, all um, Lenten season, we are going to be enjoying their offerings and also a sneak peek, uh, I have uh, contacted uh, the Reverend Bomi Kim, um, who you might know as one of our interns that we um, mentored during her time at uh, Claremont School of Theology, and she will be putting together uh, some offerings further on into the season. So we look forward to that. So with all that being said, let us join together in worship. Please join in the call to worship. Today is a day to sing praise to God. God, God continually, continually blesses, blesses us, us each, each and, and every day. day. Let your hearts rejoice and your voices shout praise to God. For, For God, God is, is great, great and worthy to, to be praised. praised. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray our opening prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning with so many concerns and issues that demand our attention. Our lives are burdened. Our spirits are tired. Guide our lives and our steps as we walk this Lenten journey. Help us to discern what you would have us do, that others may be healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray together. Oh God, as we gather, we pray for all of those who have been affected by the coronavirus, for those who have tested positive, those who are awaiting results, and the family members and friends of those affected and those who have died. We pray for our heroes in the medical field and all who are working in hospitals and urgent cares and care facilities for the elderly, rehab centers, those in care homes for vulnerable adults. Be with them, Lord, and keep them safe. We pray for our essential workers who are on duty for us during this time. Be with them, Lord, and keep them safe. We pray for all who have lost jobs in this crisis and for all of the small business owners and the small businesses who've closed their doors. We pray for anyone who is looking for new opportunities. Be with them, Lord, and keep them safe. We pray for our teachers and our parents and our children and our school administrators mm -hmm. as the school year continues to be challenging. We pray for all of those who are living and working communally, in prison, in college dorms, those who work in close quarters and are vulnerable to infection, Lord, be with them and keep them safe. We pray for all with addictions and anxiety and depression and mental health issues and all of us as we experience grief and anger during this time. We especially pray for our young people as they navigate this treacherous terrain. Help us all to survive each day until we are able to feel better. Oh Lord, we pray for peace and justice in our land. We pray for the halt of violence against our Asian American brothers and sisters. And we pray for the dismantling of systemic racism in our country for us to see one another as you see us, one human family in this world. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Texas as they experience the aftermath of the winter storm. We pray for Judy as she continues her treatment, be with her Lord and give her strength. 
We pray for Nellie who continues healing, going through her physical therapy. Be with her. We pray for Carol Castillo who is home from the hospital but needs dialysis. Be with Carol and with Ace as they go through this journey. We pray for Debbie's father, Ken, in hospice care. And we pray for Mickey, Michael's father, as he heals from his experience with COVID in rehab. We pray for the whole Peeler family. We pray for the Chamley family for health and healing, O oh Lord. We continue to pray for Dusty, Marilyn and Dawn's niece, as she continues healing from her surgery. Pam offers prayers of thanksgiving that her son's family has recovered from COVID. And also we lift up prayers for Pam's cat, Lelio, that he can feel better. We pray for the family and friends of Elsa, who is a family member of Nancy who passed away this week. For Nancy's Aunt Hiroko in need of healing. We pray for Karen and for all worried parents as their children go back to school. Especially this day, we pray for Summerlin as she goes back to school this week and for AJ as he goes back to school in a few weeks. We especially pray for all of those parents who are covered with worry. Be with them, Lord. Albert and June ask for prayers for June's sister, Ava, who was admitted to the hospital with pain. Be with her, Lord, and keep her safe. Lorna asks for prayers for Audrey, Mel's brother, whose cancer has returned. Be with her, Lord, and give her strength. Oh Lord, we lift up those who are making big life decisions about how to continue in the wake of broken relationships and lost jobs. We pray for the staff and patients at Potter Hospital in India and all of those who are experiencing medical crises and financial challenges and all who are worried and stressed and fearful. O oh Lord, we are called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you, to serve you by caring for others, not just once in a while, but always. We admit that we're not always ready to do this. The demand is great. The need is great. Our energies are limited. Help us to place our trust in you and your, our lives in your care. Help us to trust that you will give us the strength and courage that we need for this step on the journey. Be with us and help us to remember that your love is poured out for all your people and you are never far away. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. As he taught us to pray when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This week, our website went down. It may not seem like a big deal, and it, it may not turn out to be a big deal, and hopefully it will be an easy fix. But in a time in which all church activities are virtual, it feels like a big deal. <laughs> Functionally, it really doesn't make a huge difference in the life of the church. All of our videos are posted to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, and you can still access the donation page by using the link provided. And I will send you an email with all the necessary links enclosed so you have everything at your fingertips. But the website is a gathering of all the information into one virtual space. It's like the church itself, a gathering place for information and videos and data all in one place. And it shows the outside community who we are and what we believe. It's a visual demonstration of what is important to us. It's a visual demonstration of who is welcome and what is required to be a part of our community. It's a virtual answer to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Jesus' question in our scripture lesson today hits us at the very core because it asks who are we? Not only that, but who do others say we are? Who do we say that we are? 
The website says, here is a visual represent representation of who we are, what we think is important, how we live out our mission in Walnut. Now the pandemic has been an overwhelming opportunity for all of us to ask that question and answer it anew. In every aspect of our lives, who are we as a church? Who are we as a family? Who are we as a nation? Who are we as a people? Who do we say that we are? And how do we express our values? And how do we learn and grow and reassess what is important to us? How do we communicate all of those vital values and beliefs to others? Because we notice in our scripture lesson today, Jesus is not going through kind of existential questions about who am I? He is not asking who am I? But he is asking, what are others saying about me? Who do you think I am? How is Jesus communicating who he is to others? Now, according to Melina and Rohrbach in their social science commentary of the Synoptic Gospels, in the time of Jesus, it was typical in the culture for people to use a two-word ending of their name to define themselves based on outside influences. This is why it's important to identify whether somebody is Jesus of Nazareth or Saul of Tarsus or somebody from some other place. Because encoded in those two word uh, labels of wherever, Krista of Claremont, Krista of Walnut, encoded in those labels is all the information needed to place the person properly on the honor scale and therefore all of the social information people are required to know about how to interact properly with him or her. For example, if I were to introduce myself to someone who is also a pastor, I would say, I am Krista, I am the pastor at Walnut United Methodist Church. Or if I'm introducing somebody, uh, a parent, to another parent, I would say, uh, this is um, this is Mrs. Anderson. She has a child in the preschool as well. This is Mr. Yu. He also has a child in the preschool. So that way that they could understand that they have something in common. So how do we label ourselves and communicate that information to others. So again, Jesus' question in our scripture is not the modern one, who am I? Rather, he is asking, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? It is significant that he is asking the disciples and his followers, who are you believing and saying that I am? So let's look at the scripture from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. It begins like this. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Well, what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. 
So the first question that Jesus asked the disciples, it feels like an impersonal question. Who are people saying that I am? And then the following answers were given. John the Baptist and Elijah and some say one of the prophets. So why do they say John the Baptist? Some scholars believe that Jesus was an early follower of John's, but branched off at some point, drawing some supporters then away from John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist was killed, Jesus made a bid for the support of John's new leaderless supporters. And largely, he succeeded. Some of John's supporters continued in John's name, however, and to this day there is a group called the Mandeans, located now in southern Iraq, who trace their religious lineage back to John the Baptist. So why did they say Elijah? Well, Elijah was the classic prophet, and like Jesus, was from northern Israel. And Elijah, Elijah is also one of the eschatological figures predicted to come at the end of times. So in saying, maybe you're Elijah, they were predicting, you know what? Maybe you are the prophet who has come at the end of the world. In fact, the very last two verses of the Old Testament, Malachi uh, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 say, Lo! I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day that the Lord comes. So in this um, telling of Jesus' identity, they're saying maybe you're the prophet Elijah who has come at the end of times. Now, um, in the Gospel of Matthew, when this story is told, um, they also add in Jeremiah. Maybe you're Jeremiah. And of course, uh, it, Jeremiah is not mentioned in our Gospel from Mark, but um, Jeremiah and Jesus have similar um, characteristics. He, Jeremiah was called the suffering prophet, and uh, they, Jeremiah and Jesus both, both opposed the religious and political establishment of their day and both suffered for it. So their third answer is, or one of the prophets. And uh, we can add Jeremiah into that list. But then Jesus changes his question a little bit. It's more personal. He says, no, you. Who do you say that I am? Now this you in uh, the text is a plural you. Meaning Jesus was not just asking Peter for his response, but he was asking all people who were gathered with him, whether only the disciples or the rest of his followers. He was asking them, who do you say that I am? This is a question as vital for us today as it was to the disciples in the time of Jesus. Who do we understand Jesus to be? Peter understood him to be the Messiah, the son of the living God. But let's take a moment to think about and describe Jesus in our own words. Who do you understand Jesus to be? In our answer, we will find hints of not only what we need, but what we value. If we were to say, for example, Jesus is a teacher, Jesus is a savior, Jesus is a miracle worker, our answers determine how we view ourselves, how we understand our role in the world, and what we need from our God. What we name God, who we understand Jesus to be, is the name we call our God. And that naming has power. As written in our psalm, 
124 verse 8, our hope is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and earth. So who are we in his name? If we understand Jesus to be the ultimate peacemaker, reconciling warring factions, bringing together all sides to create a peaceful kingdom, then how do we live in the name of Jesus? If we understand Jesus to be the prime example of holy living, how we should treat one another, respond to conflict, show love to one another, then how do we live in the name of Jesus? If we understand Jesus to be our savior, the ultimate in forgiveness and mercy and compassion, then how do we live in the name of Jesus? of Jesus. In 1989, Henry Nouwen, a Dutch-born Catholic priest and writer, wrote a small book called In the Name of Jesus. And it advises Christian leaders to live in Christ's name, by Christ's example, by resisting the temptations of Christ that Christ faced in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, the temptation to be relevant, the temptation to be spectacular, the temptation to be powerful. Nowen spent 20 years winning renown as a famous author and teaching theology and psychology at Notre Dame, Yale, and Harvard. Before he moved to the daybreak, Lark Community for Developmentally Handicapped Persons near Toronto. In his book, he describes his understanding of Jesus through his interaction with Bill, who was his friend and companion on a trip to give a lecture. As I was preparing my presentation, he wrote, I became deeply aware of the fact that Jesus did not send his disciples out alone to preach the good news. He sent them out two by two. So I began to wonder why nobody was planning to go with me. If my present life is truly a life among the handicapped people of daybreak, why not ask one of them to join me on the journey and share in my ministry with me? After some consultation, the Daybreak community decided to send Bill Van Buren with me. And since my arrival at Daybreak, Bill and I had become good friends of all the handicapped people in the house. He was the most able to express himself with words and gestures. And often I had told Bill that those who are baptized and confirmed have a new vocation, the vocation to proclaim to others the good news of Jesus. And Bill had listened carefully to me. And when I invited him to go with me to Washington, D.C. to speak to priests and ministers, he accepted it as an invitation to join me in my ministry. We are doing this together, he said at different times in the days before we left. Yes, I kept saying, we are doing this together. You and I are going to Washington to proclaim the gospel. Bill did not for a moment doubt the truth of this. While I was quite nervous about what to say and how to say it, say it Bill showed great confidence in his task. And while I was still thinking about Bill's trip with me as primarily a trip that would be something nice for him, Bill was, from the beginning, convinced that he was going to help me. I later came to realize that he knew better than I. As we stepped on to board the plane in Toronto, Bill reminded me again, we are doing this together aren't we? Yes, Bill, I said. We sure are. After I had finished reading my text and the people had shown me their appreciation, Bill said to me, Henry, 
can I say something now? My first reaction was, oh my goodness, how am I going to handle this? He might start rambling and create an embarrassing situation. But then I caught myself in my presumption that he had done nothing of importance to say and nothing to say to the audience. Will you please sit down? Bill would like to say a few words to you. So Bill took the microphone and said, with all the difficulties he had in speaking, last time when Henry went to Boston, he took John Smeltzer with him. This time he wanted me to come with him to Washington and I am very glad to be here with you. Thank you very much. That was it. And everyone stood up and gave him warm applause. As he, we walked away from the podium, Bill said to me, Henry, how did you like my speech? Very much, I answered. Everyone was really happy with what you said. As we flew back together to Toronto, Bill said, Henry, did you like our trip? Oh yes, I answered, it was a wonderful trip and I'm so glad that you came with me. Bill looked at me attentively and then said, and we did it together, didn't we? And then I realized the full truth of Jesus' words, where two or three meet in my name, I am among them. Who do we understand Jesus to be? And how do we live in his name? How do we as individuals, as individual Christians, live in the name of Jesus? And how do we as a church live in the name of Jesus? Now is the time to rediscover who we are and who others say that we are, what we value and how we communicate those values to the rest of the world. As we live day by day, let us recognize our responsibility to represent Jesus in every tasks, in every smile, in every gesture, in every word. May we bear the name of Christ and be a model of Jesus' compassion and joy and peace and love. May we be the disciples we are meant to be and may we have the confidence to live in the name of Jesus. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Raising my Savior. song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my
God and may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you always. Amen.